Cut off your ponytails and blindly dry shave your beards. Kanan and crew are back on Rebels tonight, and we're here to talk about it. Welcome back to Star Wars News Nets, the Resistance broadcast. My name is John Hoey. In addition to Rebels' return for its final run, we're going to talk about Star Wars Episode Nine, my coverage of the Hasbro Toy Fair in New York City, the release dates of The Last Jedi on digital and Blu-ray, and answer your Twitter questions. Joining me today are James Bainey and Patrick Covey. What's up, guys? Man, I cannot wait for tonight. I'm so pumped. I don't even care what happens to Kanan. I'm just like, I I just, I can't wait. I'm (laughs) I'm without words, guys. He's wordless. He's not going to talk for the rest of the show. Guys, tonight is, ugh, so many feels. The the show is back, and not only is it back, but it's back for its final three-week run, and it's like... Part of me is so happy to see this, you know, like come to the finale, but part of me is like like dead inside. It's like, oh no, Rebels is over. It's bittersweet, baby, bittersweet. Yes, and it will be over before we know it. Um, but before we get into talking about that, we do have some poll results. As always, we have to get into, and we had asked you, based on what you've seen and read so far, who do you think will end up being the true villain of Solo, a Star Wars story? And we gave you a few choices here. 15% of you said Woody Harrelson's Tobias Beckett. 21% said that strange masked person. We're not sure who that is yet. 29% said Kira, played by Amelia Clark. And 35% of you, with the winning vote, said it's someone yet to be shown. So they haven't given it to us yet, according to most of the people who answered this poll. What do you guys think about... Uh, most of the people thinking we haven't seen the true villain in this movie yet. I think we've seen the true villain. I think it's that guy with the strange masked person, you know, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think cause these movies are, this movie in particular is just supposed to be pretty straightforward. It's like a Western. Here's your good guys. Here's your bad guy. And I don't think there's going to be a big plot twist. I've talked Ignazium about how I don't think Star Wars really is that. I think they did one plot twist once and <laughs> then now all of a sudden everybody thinks that there's always going to be some sort of like That's oh but point. they're not really the mastermind or something like that. I just think they just want to make this movie a fun movie. Han Solo versus the bad guy and he will ultimately win and good for you know whatever but I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of like double crossing and surprises and he was he was really the puppet master so um Pat, what do you think about this? I got to agree with James here on this. I think this guy is the guy. We've seen him in different environments of the film uh, in both the clips we got. First, we saw him on on top of the train fighting with Beckett, uh, which was later confirmed to be Beckett. We didn't know that at first because it was so, you know, fast and intense, uh, as George Lucas would say. Um, (laughs) And and then we see him again uh, in that clip where we what we believe is uh, Han pulling out the DL 44 on the beach surrounded by all those cronies. And that's like, that's the dead giveaway. It's like different environments, same good guy, same bad guy. That's our bad guy. Come on guys. (laughs) Now, what if that bad guy is a bad woman? (gasps) What? What Star Wars, that bad Star Wars has never had, Star Wars movies have never had the big bad. Nah. But anyway, we'll find out in, (laughs) 95 days, if you believe it's that close from today. Um, our best comment went, speaking of villains, went to a person who on Twitter goes by the name Villain, and he's at SW Movie TV, and he said, I'm thinking it's Beckett. They have said that Beckett is probably the character that shapes the future Han Solo the most, so I feel like Han is going to get burned by him. I feel like he will be a Liam Neeson in Batman Begins style villain. That could be. Like yeah, like you were I'm saying, not... James, the whole straightforward thing. Yeah, I mean, I I I could see that. Like, if they went down that route, I'd be happy with that, and I think that's a cool story for Han to grow off of. Um, I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case, but if they did that, I'd be like, heck yeah, that's awesome. I like it. All right, right on. Well, now it's time to hop into the news. The news net is burning. James, what is going on? Oh. 
Well, like I said before, it's bittersweet to say that this time is finally upon us and that Rebels will be making its return tonight on Disney XD with the two-parter episodes Jedi Knight and Doom. This week, Filoni let slip a few clips from the upcoming episodes, so... Like we do, we're going to analyze and overthink them, <laughs> but that's but that's okay. Who doesn't love a good discussion? Uh, John, <laughs> the first clip we got was all about Kanan and this meditative ritual involving him cutting off his hair. Now, I remember you did some research on what this typically means. How does that research fit in now that you've seen a little bit more of the scene? Uh, that's, you know, it's a good question. Um, and by Uh research, I really just went at Google real hard, uh, typed a lot, hit enter and got my results and then pasted them into my notes and read them. Um, but yeah, it sounds like it's one of those things where he's either ready to move on from everything and just kind of set sail into the sunset in a way, or he's ready to give up on his beliefs with his Jedi uh, Jedi rituals and his Jedi order, but I don't think that's the case. So it, it, maybe it's just a, your simple case of symbolism here where he that's them telling us like this guy is moving on and he's, he's not going to be around much longer, but I'm not really sure. What I did notice in both mm-hmm. the clips, I don't want to get into the second one too far, but there's definitely a dusk tone in the lighting and it just like the sun is setting on this on this show here. And I'm very curious to see what happens. I'm still convinced that Kanan's going to die. Um, but I want to hear what you guys think about his ritual cutting. I know like what I said when I looked it up, it means you're kind of giving up on your your ways um, and, and actually, your beliefs. <clears throat> but do you think that's I think the case that, with Kanan? That just simply killing off Kanan is almost too simple. I don't know what we're going to get with Ahsoka. But I think that the end of season two, you know, we have like Ahsoka and she dies. And then like the end of season three, you get Maul and he dies. And the end of season four, you get Kanan and he dies. It's like, I don't really think that's it. I think that we gave one noble death to one character and that was Maul. But then we still don't know what's happening with Ahsoka. And I I think that we're going to get something, a third thing, even different with, with Kanan. So, I mean, if he dies, he dies. That's fine. But I also think that it's Filoni and he's really good with these stories and they're well thought out. And I think that Kanan's journey is more than just like, Oh, getting killed. You know what I mean? Or, or I mean, it might be sacrificing himself for some reason or something, but I think mm-hmm. there's something he's going to do. That's really cool. I will say when I saw this scene, the first thing I thought was the like typical, like suicide thing. You know what I mean? Like, do you know what I'm talking about? Where like, um, <clears throat> I don't know what it's called. It might oh, be, wow. But it's Seppuku. like where they, where Japanese men feel like they have dishonored people, so they, they stab themselves and then they get their head cut off, mm-hmm. um, in, because they they'd rather not bring dishonor to their people, or they felt like they've dishonored um, something. But he's sitting in this state, and then he like is is it's in front of him, and he picks up the knife, and I'm just like, this is weird. This has a very like he's going to kill mm-hmm. himself kind of a thing. So. I don't know. Maybe that kind of ties into it too. I obviously don't think he's going to kill himself, but I, what I was saying earlier is like he might sacrifice himself for the good of the galaxy or the good of his friends. Um, Pat, do you think that's the case? I mean, what what was your takeaway from this scene? No, no. Mm-hmm. Well, my takeaway from the scene uh, kind of ties in with a little bit of what John was researching a couple weeks back when we heard that this was a possibility. Uh, when we first saw that trailer come out where he cut the hair off, we knew that, uh, like, we were like, what's the deal with that? And basically what we found is that in the Japanese culture, not only are they doing this because it's like a shame thing or they feel like they're going against their ways, what they're actually doing is if somebody close to them is mm. also lost, that might be another reason as to why they cut the hair as like... Mm-hmm to symbolize that not only am I losing that person, but I'm also losing a piece of myself. And that's a, a reminder to them to, uh, to, you know, atone for what might have caused that and to become a better person. So the way I've always considered it um, in my own personal way is when a uh, Jedi Padawan gets their braid cut off, that's like them mm-hmm. going to that next step to say, I'm ready to take on bigger tasks. I'm ready to achieve uh, the next level to do what must be done. Well, let me follow that up then. One out of five stars on the ability to blindly cut your hair with a knife. 
How did how did Kanan perform in this situation? <laughs> he's been he's been doing stuff with lightsabers, uh, blind with the force. So I, I'm telling you, man, he he did it with the force. I, that, he missed a patch though I'm in the more, back. I don't I'm know what's I'm going on. I'm more impressed with little... the dry shave with a knife and not having any razor burn. Oh, that too. So now yeah. I don't I don't know if that's because they didn't want to adam, animate razor burn. Or he's just that good at shaving, and he he used like no, the he just he, saw Crocodile Dundee, and that's a knife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he uh, shaving with the big knife. It almost makes me wonder if there's some sort of form of like you know like rebellion aftershave that's out there on the market. Yeah, mm. they, well, they make uh-huh. it out of pure midichlorians, and then it just tingles ah, on your on your okay. cheeks. Yeah, okay. there you go. Um, I I do think I have to say this, and I'm I'm not to burst the bubble on this mission that. Uh, they're about to go on to save Hera, but it's pretty anticlimactic because we know that she survived. So mm-hmm. we imagine they're going to be the ones to get her out of there, right? Unless she unless she well, gets out by herself. So it's isn't this isn't this isn't one of those things where it's like, is she going to make it? We can already cross that off. So that it takes a little bit of that drama out of it for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's move on to the second clip. Then uh, we're treated to. Uh, involved preparations to rescue Hera, like you said. It looks like Sabine will be tagging along, and uh, I don't, I don't, Fen Rao, a Wedge, maybe I couldn't really make I it out. It I, don't, Martin, I don't know who that was. Mart Matten, is that who that is? I possibly, uh, Pat. Do you know who it is? Do you know? It's Ezra. Who? You think it's Ezra? I, I went back and watched it several times. It's Ezra. He no, talks. I went back scene. and watched it several times, and I was like, I can't pick out who this person is. Like, yeah, I thought it was someone else too. Maybe yeah. it is. I mean, uh, at least from what I had seen, he's in that sequence, but I believe that was Mart Matten helping them get ready, but I don't think that was him in the Imperial suit. I think that was Ezra. No, okay, so there's four people at in this scene. There's Zeb, who's driving the motorcycle, and then Kanan, mm-hmm. who's just whatever he's doing, and then there's two other Imperials in, right. in the outfit. They're not Imperials, but they're in Imperial outfit. One is Sabine, mm-hmm. and the other one is... You guys think it, it might be Mart Matten? I do. I was. I thought at one point it might be Fen Rao. I thought at one point it was Wedge. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm I was just kind of confused. <laughs> I mean, you can watch it again, but like I watched it numerous times, and I don't think there's enough there to really pick out who it is. Because did you pause? Sabine, yes, yeah. <laughs> Sabine, they show her hair to mm-hmm. give her character, but they don't yeah. for this other character. And I'm not surely really certain what that is. The only one that could I could pull from is that Fen Rao because they never show his hair really. They always like every time he's wearing that like who would suit who, who would make the most sense? Hair. Who would make the most sense? If if Sabine's going, possibly Ezra. Yeah, but doesn't the first clip kind of say this is how this is the way Ezra Ezra's going to go on this journey, kind of by himself? No, I agree. I agree. All right, I'm looking at this now, and let's see here. It is. Yeah. It's so. That's Ezra. That's Ezra's nose. That's definitely I don't, I don't Ezra. Know. Yeah, we don't know. I don't think I don't think we're gonna get any confirmation on who it is. I mean, you can be confident that you know who it is, but I I looked at it numerous times. We're gonna watch. We're gonna watch in like two hours, I just, and we'll find. Yeah, out. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to talk. I just want to talk about flying a kite in Star Wars. Oh, it's ridiculous. Uh, I didn't like <laughs> did, it at did, all. Did you not no, like this? I'm sorry. No, nope. Like unhook the unhook the hook, and I'll unhook my hook, and then we'll just start floating. Not nope. No thanks, guys. You don't this think is it's, classic. You don't think it's kind of like. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like a stealth, like, we no, need to break in, um, and this is the only way. No. This is something that goes back to the George Lucas days. Uh, do you guys ever remember hearing them talking about he uh, really enjoyed watching that film about World War II, about the uh, raid of the Dam Busters? Yeah, I know he would always It's, it's some of that. To, yeah. And then he did have, there were some concept designs, I think maybe even the original trilogy of winged creatures that people would ride on and, and really weird things that never found its way mm-hmm. actually into mm-hmm. star wars and this might be a slight nod to that in a sense who knows because we know how dialed in yeah. filoni is to old lucas ideas yeah and so that was part of my that was like another question i was going to ask is like do you think that um mystery person and sabine are actually just going to help him get past the first step or do you think that they're actually going to go on the mission with him? Do you think this is more like him no, solid yeah. snaking? It's going to be into... a tear off. Them as the yeah. Imperials are going to go do a little Han and Luke as stormtroopers kind of thing. 
And I can't wait till you guys out there are like in the comments, like, it's this person, you dummy. And we're all just yeah, sitting here yeah. like, who is it? Um, and yeah, it, it, it's going to be one of those things where Kanan just does a solo um, venture, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know about Pat. But... So, Pat, do you think Kanan's going to be going on his own here or are they going to go with him? Yeah, this is this harkens back to the A New Hope stuff with Ben Kenobi kind of going off and doing his own thing, uh, you know, shutting down the tractor beam. I highly doubt he's going to have one of those strike me down and I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Kanan's not going out like that. I'm sorry. No, there's just no way. He's had <laughs> such a huge arc doing all this crazy stuff. I I don't really I see think, that I think But hey, I think if you want to fight me, at me. I, 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 I'm in the Mortis thing. I, yeah, there's some Morta stuff in there, but <laughs> I think that's going to come later. That That's not going to be week one. But I'm sorry. Know, that's going to be like a week two thing. You know I want them all to die, as many of them as possible. So the Morta oh, thing doesn't yeah. work for oh, me. Oh, yeah. But I, if, that, if that's any way to get them out of the galaxy to make sense of it uh, so they're not mm-hmm. off running deli somewhere, then uh, I'm cool with it. Gosh. Who says you can't <clears throat> run a deli on Mortis, man? That's true. Yeah, that's true. The Mortis stuff. Any customers. The Morta stuff is all about Ahsoka. It doesn't have anything to do with Kanan. All right. We'll find that mm-hmm. out. But um, last up for the major news this week, J.J. Abrams has made the move of hiring Paul Inglis as the supervising art director for Episode Nine. Now, Paul has had a long history of films he has been involved with, including, in chronological order, Children of Men, Prometheus, Dracula Untold, and the drop-dead gorgeous film Blade Runner 2049, who was under the direction of the cinematographer Bradford Young, who has also moved over to Lucasfilm by taking up the upcoming Solo, A Star Wars Story, which is out this May. John, do you think that this was a good move for J.J. for Episode 9? You know, it's funny. It's like art direction. Unless you're like a super-duper movie award nerd or movie technical nerd you know i never really think Mm -hmm. about art direction very much um it's like unless you're unless it has to be spoken about you don't think about art direction right and but that's what i think blade runner 2049 did is made me think about art direction for some reason Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. every shot in that movie looks like it could be a poster the colors are vibrant the scenery is incredible the sets are outstanding so just from that alone and i looked at i tried to google images from skyfall the bond movie he did he did two bond movies i think prometheus mm-hmm. had some cool stuff too jason born uh, i don't know and the, yeah, you know, he does a lot of spy thrillers as well which i didn't think were it's not that they're bad they have good yeah. i'm sure they have you know good uh cinematography and things like that but I, the ones I mentioned, Prometheus, Dracula Untold, you know, Children of Men, like these were things that really are just like you just walked into a painting for every single scene. Right, exactly. And every shot of that movie, if you look at like Blade Runner, it, it kind of, me anyway, reminded me of like those old weird Ralph McQuarrie photos where it was like mm-hmm. odd tones, weird objects. So I could see it totally working. Um, and more so, I mean, I'll pack it in here in a minute, and I have a couple other points later about how he can connect to other people who are associated with Star Wars, but more so just the fact that the wheels are moving, and we were seeing actual tangible things happening with Episode Nine. now is just getting me a little excited. Pat, let me ask you, Paul back in 2011 worked with a TV series called Game of Thrones oh. for 10 episodes specifically episodes one through 10 of the 73 episode long series. So could this be a test run before the new series starts hiring? And I mean, am I just pulling things out of nowhere? Is this like, we're going to give him one feature film, see how he does in the star Wars world. And then maybe he can reunite with this game of Thrones, uh, coworkers. It's possible, but I feel like this is less of a test run and more of like, he's, his resume is just so good. Um, I, I feel like uh, him teaming up with Doug Chang potentially for episode nine would be a very good uh, a good setup. They're both very talented, uh, you know, in, in the world of art direction stuff for these films. So um, I would really like to see what his take on this is. I hope they give him more artistic liberties into uh, mm-hmm. how they want to set up shots and, and scenes and things. Uh I personally have probably not seen like any of his work. I don't. I didn't know about this guy till like this past week when we got the news. Literally know nothing about this guy. But to see his resume, I'm like, wow, that's impressive for him to be involved with all these uh, big and, name films. So I trust him. 
if you think about what this movie has to do, which is close out stories, there's going to be some big, heavy scenes in terms of, you know, dramatic, impactful scenes, including probably big space battles, big fights. And yeah, they need yeah, the set pieces to back yeah, them up. Yeah, like what's better than an awesome throne room set like Return of the Jedi, just a big, huge fight between Rey and Kylo Ren and this guy with his, you know, just think of like the the sets from Blade Runner and stuff. That I mean, that would be a huge, huge scene, scene that we could be in store for. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, that just kind of gets me excited just trying to think about that possibility. Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities out there. Um, if this guy has had these you know these giant dramatic sets and and vibrant colors i feel like he is gonna you know take star wars to the next level on a visual level we've never seen before i'm sure he can still do a lot of things with not just the vibrant colors but maybe some of the darker colors uh, some of the first order stuff he can start to tap into that maybe take it to a an even more dull like gray look like more on top of what we haven't seen because What's great about the Imperial and First Order look throughout the films is that they allow the characters, to some extent, have other colors so that they pop a little bit more by having that darker uh, tone behind them. And I think I feel like if if they do it right, if they if they set up Rey and Kylo Ren with maybe more vibrant costuming, or, or they do something slightly different, they can really make those characters pop a little bit more too. So you don't just have to go for vibrant colors; you got to go for the opposite end of the spectrum as well. Personally, for me, I yeah, I think this is a this is a home run. I mean, it really it, is. I, I don't think anybody is is aware of this person. He's not a household name, but you look at his resume and you you understand immediately that he's gifted and he's very talented in what he does. Right. And uh, and Lucasfilm and J.J. Abrams are all the better to have him. You know, smart move in my opinion. Let me ask you: Do you think they go by connections in terms of like? Because I tried to follow the little Kevin Bacon six degree chain with this guy, mm-hmm. and he did the art direction for. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, which was written and directed by Chris McQuarrie, who came in to kind of help out Rogue One quite a bit with some rewrites and reshoots and stuff. So you think he, in getting involved with Rogue One, like kind of introduced and said, hey, you know, this guy did my art direction? Or do you think it's just... Do you think it's just a pure coincidental thing? Like, I wonder how Lucasfilm works in that way, if you make connections. Because obviously, like, Harrison Ford didn't walk off the set of Blade Runner 2049 and be like, hey, JJ, this guy really knocked the art direction out of the park on this film. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. he, they, they brought him in from some other way. So, I, I mean, that's just more of a hypothetical question, I guess, in terms of... I like, mean, I think if your question is, do you think that in the town where it's all about who you know... Is it about who you know? <laughs> I think it is about who you know. I mean, everybody is going to be working with their friends. Like, yeah. hey, you know, like I'm looking for a, a a guy who can do this. Do you know a guy who can do that? Yeah, I know a guy who can do that. You know, and they just like reach out to other movies that they've worked on. Like, I know, I don't know if many people know that listen to the podcast, but I used to be in a band and oftentimes that's how that stuff work. Like, Hey, I'm looking for a guitar tech. Do you know anybody who could guitar tech? It's like, yeah, like this dude, he used to work for a day to remember. He used to work for, you know, this band and this band and this band. And, and the thing is, is like techs and, um, I should, I should just say crew in general, whether you're like in management or you're in like a uh, guitar world or you're in like the front of house doing sound engineering and stuff. Like all these people work for like, multiple bands because they just pop from these right. people to these people to these people yeah. and like most people don't understand like that a lot of bands know each other simply because they've never toured with them but all of their friends have toured with them yeah so they know people by just like one degree oh yeah one who more you, person over who so you know is absolutely <clears throat> huge and i mean if if they're that i guess more in the sense i was asking like when they were finishing up rogue one it was probably mid 2016 so you have like mid 2016 they're wrapping up rogue one and and chris mcquarrie's there you know helping them out i wouldn't you know what if they made that connection then like hey i got this art director you guys have one yet for nine and oh yeah put them on the list and they probably call them like that's that's something that definitely could have happened way back then before jj even got in so it could have been a kathleen kennedy decision 
And if we've learned anything as of late is that Kathleen Kennedy, she might not necessarily know people, but if she knows people that know people, they generally, you know, give her the slip and be like, hey, this person can do this. Like, you should totally and hire And what's them better this. than after dealing with a director who's getting so much, un- like, flack, which I think is undeserved, like Ryan Johnson's getting in the public, she sends JJ out there like, JJ, tell them you hired this art director. So people are like, oh, JJ's back. He's getting the good art director. Okay, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good PR move, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think it's a good move all around. I think we've covered just about every facet of it. I, I, I think you know, episode nine is going to be good, and I think it's in good hands. Um, there were some other stories that happened this week. Uh, should we do a scoundrels rundown just to cover those stories? Yeah, I guess we can do a scoundrels rundown. What do you say, Chewy? Let's punch it. <laughs> The Last Jedi is taking its final victory lap around theaters, and if you wanted to see it once more but your theater pulled it, worry not, as your personal copy of the movie is not that far away. As we reported on StarWarsNewsNet.com, a search on New Zealand's iTunes page by our own Pat Covey revealed the digital download date is set at March 14th, only three weeks away. Actually, 23 days away three weeks. I went a bit further myself and reached out to Target for some information on the 4K Blu-ray release date, and their reps told me that the estimated release date for the physical copies of the film is Tuesday, March 27th, and the movie is already available for pre-order. From home video to toys we go, this past Saturday I represented Star Wars Newsnet and the Resistance broadcast at the Hasbro Toy Fair event in New York City to get a first-hand look at all the upcoming toys and merch heading our way from the Star Wars galaxy. An official early glimpse of some of the items were released online last week, including Lego minifigures and the Millennium Falcon, Black Series figures, 3.75-inch action figures, and the regular Falcon toy. For my full report on all the new merch I saw at the event, just go to StarWarsNewsNet.com. Speaking of the Millennium Falcon, a lot is being made about the Falcon's different look in the Solo movie, and the writers explain that like with anything else, Every owner has their own style and touch, and it sounds like Lando Calrissian liked to use the Falcon more for entertainment than anything, which kind of explains its sleek, smooth look and features, and there's no doubt we'll probably have a solid understanding how the Falcon winds up getting its more iconic, familiar look when the movie hits theaters in just 95 days. I keep saying that's crazy. Three months, Han Solo, in theaters. For the full articles on all these news items we talked about on this episode, Be sure to head to StarWarsNewsNet.com, where you'll also find interviews, editorials, comic and book reviews, our Cantina fan forum, and more. That's your Scoundrels Rundown for this week, so let's check in with Pat to see which of your questions he's pulled from our question vault. Chewie, get us out of here. Thanks, John and Salacious. Now we're going to move on and talk about some tweets in the Twitterverse. That's right. You guys have sent us your questions over the past few days and weeks, and now we're going to review them. Our first question comes from Scotty Jero at the Scott Jero, and he may be perhaps one of our biggest fans of the podcast. I would agree with that. Scotty's awesome. And uh, he was just in a car wreck uh, last week, so we want to sh- uh, definitely shout out some uh, some warm wishes to him. Hope he's uh, still doing pretty well. No more Kessel Run, Scotty. No more Kessel no Runs more. in the Honda. So his question this week was, all right, Resistance Broadcast, do you think we may see Maz in the solo movie? John, what is your take? Scotty, I think we're going to have a better chance of seeing your Honda in the solo movie than we will see Maz Kanata <laughs> in the solo movie. Um, I think it was nice that we see that Han had other friends in different parts of the galaxy when he was older. Maybe he knew her around this time, but I don't see how she fit. She barely fit in The Last Jedi, and that time frame worked out. So I just there's going to be way enough characters to load into this movie that we don't really need to pigeonhole, or I should say shoehorn Maz into it. Um, so I, I don't think we see her. I hope we don't see her, to be honest with you. Uh, so my guess would be no, but Scotty, you're the man. Thanks for the question. And I'll see you on Twitter, buddy. Yeah. I got to agree with John on this. I mean, Maz has like, you know, her infamous watering hole to run too many labor disputes, not enough time to meet up with young Han. Our next question comes from Johan person at Yope 77. And they asked us, uh, resistance broadcast. Do you think there will be both droids and Wookiees working on Kessel considering what C3PO says to R2 in the beginning of a new hope, James, 
How are you feeling about this? Yeah, I mean, okay, so we're looking at this question. Do we think that there will be droids and Wookiees on Kessel, considering what C-3PO says to R2-D2 at the beginning of A New Hope? Well, at the beginning of A New Hope, he says to him, we'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel, smashed into who knows what. So you have to think that if C-3PO thinks that they're going to be sent to the spice mines, then it's probable that droids could get sent to the spice mines now i've always kind of taken that statement as in like maybe they won't get sent specifically to the spice mines but their ship or the people that they take care of would get sent to the spice mines but there's no way that the spice mines of kessel don't have droids like good droids bad droids i don't think they keep keep like slave droids Mm -hmm. i know jabba the hut kind of did that but I think, I don't know. I just don't really see them being like, oh, we need a workforce. I think they they would like have like evil droids or something. I don't know. I don't I don't think the droids themselves would be the slaves. However, on the other side of that, the Wookiees, I do actually think we're going to see a lot of Wookiees on Kessel, um, mm-hmm. especially since we've even we've known that the Empire has had Wookiees as slaves for many years. I mean, we even got that in Revenge of the Sith. We got that in Rebels. Um, so, um We actually even got that in Life Debt Aftermath. I mean, Mm -hmm. for a very long time, um, that planet has been under control, and they've been sending the Wookiees off of the planet to other places, especially and specifically Kessel. So um, I do think we're going to get droids and and Wookiees on Kessel. Yeah, I got to agree with James here. I feel like uh, if you're going to run a a smooth ship, you got to have all the droids to help you along. And uh, we have enough, uh, you know, Wookiee references in canon to basically confirm that. And don't forget that when Ron Howard was tweeting some stuff out, we saw some stuff with uh, maybe Chewie and his wife Mala reuniting and having a Wookiee embrace. So maybe that has something to do with uh, the during or after of their of their uh, bondage I, I hope and Han not, saving them. Yeah, we'll I hope there's not too like a really sad Wookiee scene or something. Like I don't want to see that, man. Oh, you know it's coming. It's going to tug at the heartstrings, man. I hope not. Maybe this is the beginning of Lumpy's life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lumpy. Oh boy. I wonder what Lumpy would think of our third question. Yes. All right, our next question comes from Shannon Smith, one of our friends of the podcast at Shannon Nick Smith, and she asked resistance broadcast if ewan mcgregor somehow doesn't come back from obi-wan do you think they'll go for someone else example nikolai how's that nikolai nikolaj i I don't know how that's pronounced uh but nikolaj coster waldo who plays jamie lannister in game of thrones or wait till perhaps ewan is free thanks for taking my questions and may the force be with you let's start with this one off uh, john give me your take i Someone told me, and they weren't able to tell me how, but they said that Ewan McGregor signed the dotted line months ago. Um, and I believe it. Now, in terms of making this movie, would they do it without Ewan McGregor? Absolutely not. So whatever, you know, I'm sure he's not that busy. I mean, he, he was doing a Fargo TV show, and I don't know he, that he's doing a Life Less Than Ordinary Part 2 or whatever other train spotting three. I mean, he's going to be available. Men men who still stare at goats. Men. Yeah. Men who stared at goats harder. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Yeah. He's going to be available. They're going to book him. I don't think there's any doubt there. Do you guys think there's any chance that Ewan McGregor is not playing Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah. I think that there there's, there's absolutely no way that they go, you know what? For money or for timing, we couldn't snag Ewan McGregor. <laughs> We're just going to go with this other person. I, I honestly just think that's like, that's suicide for Lucasfilm. Yeah. Like what would, what the fans would just be like, what are you I doing? Actually, like, I actually feel like they're making this movie because it makes sense based on how perfect it is for Ewan McGregor to come back for it. I think he's yeah. the reason they're making the movie. <laughs> like, I think like they're looking at it as if, it, like they're like that could be cool maybe maybe we'll do that down the line i don't know and then they're like well if we do it down the line it's not gonna it's not gonna work yeah. as well yeah you know we might have to get somebody else or it might be harder or you know who knows i mean like so, sometimes people just pass away for whatever reason they're like man mm-hmm. that was a huge missed opportunity mm-hmm. so i think they're just doing it just to do it because they don't have any other options really right now 
that are that perfect. So as far as somebody else being cast, I just don't even think it's an option. And, um, or, or will they wait for him whenever he's free? Like, first of all, I think he becomes free. Yeah, exactly. When, yeah. when, when, they, when they want to make a star Wars movie with him as the focus, he becomes free I, and all other projects wait for him to be done with star. I, Wars. I can't wait till that he's at another movie premiere or press junkets and like for the five billionth time some reporter annoying as all hell asks him hey are you gonna play obi-wan and he's like yep i'm back baby yep <laughs> 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 like the the reporter was sent to that junket just to be like and you, i know you're gonna hate it you, you ask him the same question we get it all the time and he's like all right so we asked him the question and then when he would mcgregor's like yes <laughs> then the reporter doesn't, doesn't even know yeah, how to react no to any like, question. What? What is it? Are, did we just find this out? Uh, is this breaking news? And he's like, he has a yes. he has a mic that looks like a lightsaber hilt, and he just drops it on the table and walks off. <laughs> and they're like, Ewan, Ewan, when is it happening? I don't know, Pat. Are we being ridiculous or what? Is it? There's no chance, right, Pat? It's he's Obi Wan. No. Well, unle- the only exception is if he's doing, you know, like T three train spotting seventeen, okay, so or like, no. or Moulin R- Moulin Rouge two. I mean, like, it- it's asinine for anybody else to play this. I looked up the Google images of this guy. I'm sorry, Game of Thrones fans. This guy does not look close enough. And if if we've learned anything, the whole point of them casting Ewan in the first place was because he looks so much like, um. Uh, the original Obi Wan Kenobi. I mean, it's there. There, that was the main draw is that this dude could act. He was willing to do a trilogy, and he looked exactly like him. I mean, there is no one else who can take this role. I'm sorry, like, it's okay. I guess if you want to cast a new Han Solo, because let's be real, at Harrison's age, there's probably nobody in this entire planet out of like the thousands of people who auditioned for that role of young Han Solo. The fact that Alden Ehrenreich was the closest they could get. I mean, like, but you already have Ewan. It's like, take Ewan and run with it. He he won't be too busy. I'm not even worried about like, is he going to do this? It's more like, John, where did you get your source on where did he sign the dotted line? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I still think it's a dumb reason. I, I, I still think it's a dumb movie though (laughs) i Mm -hmm. we're gonna have a star wars war about that someday because i just don't i don't see the benefit of a obi-wan movie i think people think it's gonna be really cool like i said and it's just not i think there's no story i think they're gonna make it just because it it's easy to make and market because you already have a guy who did it for three years for three movies yeah and that 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 makes sense, like kind of in theory. But it's like, do you really want that? And I know I kind of do. I kind of right do. now in their cars yelling at their radios. Yes. Yeah, I kind of yes, do, man. I do Give really me that want fan that fan service. But yeah, I, I love fan service stuff. I just this one seems weird to me. It just seems like it's there, but I mean, you have the perfect age of a character. James, you're gonna go see but, an opening night, right? Oh yeah, I'm already <laughs> mine. It's Star Wars. Come on, yeah, man. there you go. Yeah. Uh, now, James, I know you're a bit canon junkie uh, like the rest of us. Uh, is it? Do you feel like maybe like they're giving us you know enough to sustain through the comics and stuff like what they've been doing with, uh, you know, like this transitional Obi Wan between three and four? You feel like that's enough to to sustain us if we don't get the film? Too much. That's you why feel like I don't they've already the given us too much, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't like. I feel like they're already kind of alluding at these like bigger journeys and other characters that he's involved in and all this other stuff. And I'm like, I don't, I never thought that's what he was doing, but like I said, we'll have a star Wars war about it someday or some other discussion. But, um, today's not the day. I just think that if they are going to make it, they're mm-hmm. definitely sticking with Ewan. Yeah. If you guys haven't gotten into like the, uh, Marvel star Wars line, definitely check out those, uh, journals of Ben Kenobi, that arc. It's really, really good. Uh, it gives you a little bit of insight into what kind of Ben was doing in his whole deal with Owen. It's a pretty good read. So check it out if you get the chance. All right. Thanks guys for sending in all of your questions. If we didn't read your question on this episode, don't worry. It'll get locked in the questions vault and we will eventually get around to answering it. If you haven't already sent us a question, you can send it over to us on Twitter at RBATSWNN or at our email resistancebroadcast at gmail.com. We will definitely try to get it in the episode and have a good discussion about it. Let's close this Millennium Falcon door and move on. Back to you, John. Just don't close it on any 70-year-old actor's leg, and we'll be fine. Close it on Kylo Ren. 
Yeah, <laughs> that'd be that'd be the greatest way to, for him to die. Just like the hydraulics Maybe. break and he just gets crushed into the Millennium Falcon and you see like the Wicked Witch of the East legs hanging out and it's Kylo Ren's. Um, in addition to sending us your questions, more importantly, be sure to subscribe to the Resistance broadcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Please take five seconds and leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and like our episodes on SoundCloud and YouTube. We appreciate it. Head over to our store, tpublic.com slash user slash resistance broadcast and pick up resistance broadcast merchandise. Our new Thrawn, Lego Kylo, and Teletubby Poe shirts posted yesterday and they're only 14 bucks. And on Wednesday, tpublic is having a site-wide discount through the weekend on all items. So if you have been thinking about picking up a shirt, coffee mug, sticker, poster, whatever, get it on sale starting Wednesday. It's truly the best way to support our show. So we appreciate it. For all of your latest Star Wars news, reviews, editorials, and information, go to our website, StarWarsNewsNet.com. Hey, James, where can people find you on the internet? Well, on the internet, you can find me at Meyer Trunks, M-I-R-A-H-T-R-U-N-K-S. That's on Twitter and Instagram. But if you want to find me in real life, I'm just going to be sitting in my house debating which one of those shirts do I want. But Thrawn. But Kanan. But Thrawn. But, but Kanan. Mm. <laughs> mm. I want that Kanan shirt, but I want that Thrawn shirt. Anyway, I'll come up to a decision. I got another week to decide. <laughs> Get them both, please. <laughs> hey, Pat, where are you at? You guys can find me signing the dotted line to star in Salacious Crumb, a Star Wars story. <laughs> and publicly denying it several times in front of media. No, I'm just kidding, guys. You can find me on social media at Gannon136 on Twitter or also over on the Cantina Forum and stumbling over my words every week while recording these episodes. But you don't hear that because I've edited it all out. Thanks, everybody, and may the Force be with you. All right. Thanks, Pat. And if your eardrums haven't, haven't blown out yet and you can hear me now, you can hit me up on Twitter at Johnny Hoey and also find me writing articles and editorials at StarWarsNewsNet.com. And today is my wife's birthday, so happy birthday, Kathleen. Woo! Thanks to you all out there. Yeah. Yeah, you. No, no, no. You, listening right now, for supporting the Resistance broadcast. Please, please keep spreading the word. Tell your friends, family, coworkers, any fellow Star Wars fan that you just know on social media... Let them know about our show. Anyone that you know that likes Star Wars, just let them know about the show. That's all. For those of you listening for the first time, thanks for checking us out and stick around as we have a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. I can tell you right now, just in the next month alone. Tune in to our next episode this Thursday, where we'll talk more on the creation of the Solo movie, whether George Lucas should just stay away, and we'll discuss how many new Star Wars movies do we really want to see a year. So make sure you're subscribed and ready for our next transmission Thursday morning right here on the Resistance Broadcast.